Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empower Neurologist. Today we're going to have a very interesting conversation with Dr. Matthew Phillips. You may remember him. I've interviewed him before. Uh, he wrote a very interesting paper on the use of the ketogenic diet as a treatment for Parkinson's disease. Today we're going to talk about fasting. Now we've talked quite a bit about fasting. We've talked about the ketogenic diet. Uh, fasting increases ketones, so there's a lot of overlap there. And we're going to talk to Dr. Phillips about specifically the role of fasting in various neurological conditions, including uh, cognitive decline, including Parkinson's, and how fasting is really very what we call neuroprotective. Uh, it has other mechanisms. It increases the production of something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that increases the growth of new neurons, um, the connection of neurons, and there are many other uh, activities that are induced by fasting, including something we've also talked about quite a bit called autophagy, whereby our bodies are able to rid themselves of defective cells, as it were, and mitophagy, where we get rid of not, uh, not very good functioning my, uh, mitochondria, allowing what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, a great term uh, that means uh, enhancing our ability to grow new mitochondria, which as it relates to the brain being such an energy uh, demanding organ in our bodies is actually very important. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Matthew Phillips. He is a full-time cl uh, clinical and research neurologist at Waikato Hospital in Hamilton, uh, New Zealand. His foremost passion is to explore the potential and feasibility as well as safety and efficacy of what are called metabolic therapies like changing uh, energetics. Uh, particularly involved in things like ketogenic diet. We've talked about that before. And as we'll talk to uh, about today, fasting. And how these approaches create uh, what are called alternate metabolic states that may improve not only the symptoms, but also function and, importantly, quality of life for people with a variety of neurological issues, be it Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, uh, multiple sclerosis, and others. Uh, he will hopefully today touch on uh, even the use of fasting uh, in the treatment of cancer. He did recently publish a paper on that as well. In 2017, his team conducted the, a uh, first uh, of its type randomized control study involving the ketogenic diet as a treatment for Parkinson's disease. We featured him on the Empower Neurologist talking about that in the past in an uh, excellent episode. Uh, in 2020, his team is conducting a, a first-of-its-kind randomized crossover study of using the ketogenic diet as a treatment uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, really looking forward to our time together today. Let's uh, jump right into our interview. Hello, Dr. Phillips. How are things in New Zealand? They are excellent, Dave. Thanks very much for asking. And congratulations on uh, no COVID-19 anymore. That's quite an accomplishment. Yep, it's very helpful, especially when you're trying to do trials. It can it can be a real problem, but no, it's all good here now. So does that mean there are no restrictions in terms of people going out and doing things? And is it just wide open or are there restrictions? Pretty much. The, uh, there's pretty much no restrictions now. We just moved down to a very, uh, you know, low or no restriction mode. So, yeah, I mean, life's pretty much back to normal. That's great. Well, uh, what we're going to talk about today, um, I already, our viewers already know we talked about it in the intro, but well, that's thunder. <laughs> um, we, uh, you and I came together through some incredible serendipity, uh, you must admit, that I ran into your parents while voting in British Columbia and you live in New Zealand. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a long story, but Nonetheless, uh, you've taken an interest in something that I find very, very uh, fascinating, and that is basically uh, what's called bioenergetics. What is it that powers our, our cells, our bodies, our organ systems? And you've applied it to neurology, so uh, on two counts, I'm, I'm very interested. And you wrote a really incredible paper just a few months ago on the notion of fasting and how that relates to neurological uh, conditions. There's not a lot of people out there talking about it, though uh, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, I just want to say at the beginning of our time together um, that you did a, a great job. I know that you're a pioneer in this, and um, you know, congratulations for sticking with it. 
So you Thanks. are talking about, uh, as you and I have talked about, targeting the fire and not just the smoke, not just the symptoms. And uh, let's just jump in. Uh, you've got this incredible interest in the metabolism uh, aspect of neurological conditions. Let's begin with uh, why in the world would you consider fasting for a patient with a neurological condition? Okay. Uh, so with any question, I think it's always good to tackle the, the how, but more importantly, the why. Um, and we often in medicine tackle the how. We talk about mechanisms and how, <clears throat> you know, how this works and that works and what these enzymes are doing. So I could get into the bioenergetics and talk about how I really like how um, the idea of flipping your body into an altered metabolic state <clears throat> where you have lower insulin, uh, you know, um, uh, lowered sort of growth fat, uh, things like IGF-1, um, upregulated um, master regulators of metabolism like PGC-1 alpha and AMPK. I could talk about all that stuff, um, but really uh, it's the why that matters in these disorders. Uh, and if you think of it as an ev evolutionary framework, then um, basically uh, when we were sort of uh, evolving for 2 million years of <clears throat> evolution, we were in a hunter-gatherer mode, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, during that time, we would often go without food and their nutrients weren't always available. And uh, in an evolutionary, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, during those times, you actually had to perform better from a neurological point of view. You had to be able to um, perhaps uh, think more clearly, uh, have more attention on your uh, you know, prey if you're hunting something and um, be able to, uh, you know, uh, perhaps even see better and hear better and things like that. So um, really my interest in this is about uh, trying to return our bodies uh, for large periods of time to that altered metabolic state, that sort of hunter state, which uh, in theory should have a, a substantial impact on a lot of these disorders, um, the most prevalent disorders we're talking about today, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, and so on. So uh, even beyond humans, I mean, it, it, you know, even uh, single-celled organisms seem to respond appropriately to, a stre to stress. We call this hormesis. And uh, you made a very uh, interesting comment in your most recent paper uh, that we really haven't had enough time to adapt, perhaps metabolically and genetically, I would say, uh, to this uh, nonstop provision of, of calories, of, of nutrients that now kind of since the advent of agriculture pretty much, you know, there are exceptions, characterizes what, uh, what we experience. When we deprive our bodies uh, of uh, nutrients for a period of time, um, and we need to talk about what fasting means, what is intermittent fasting, what does it allow, uh, water, etc. But when we do that, it represents a stress. And what are some of the good things that are derived from that stress? Yeah, so um, there's a whole host of things because you're you're really changing the whole metabolism, uh, bioenergetics, and more of the body. So you take a medication that often has one uh, target, right? A medication changes like one pathway uh, often. Uh, however, with fasting, you're uh, changing uh, uh, almost everything. You're changing hundreds of pathways simultaneously. Uh, so you're turning the body into a whole state. And um, lots of things change. So like uh, your insulin levels go down uh, for one thing. And um, that uh, can be, uh, you know, uh, really good uh, because along with that comes uh, an elevation in uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which from a neurological point of view um, can enhance sort of uh, neurogenesis and um, uh, remodeling of the synapses and things like that. Um, you uh, elevate other things like PGC1 alpha, which is a master uh, regulator of mitochondrial metabolism. And uh, it, so it enhances mitochondria, biogenesis, those are the batteries of our cells. And it can actually make them more efficient at producing energy. Um, there's some evidence that that can happen. You have a master regulator of, of metabolism called AMPK. And AMPK um, is a nutrient sensing um, enzyme, and it basically um, 
uh, induces a, a lot of sort of uh, processes that make ourselves more effective at what they do, including uh, autophagy, which is this really um, interesting process that uh, where the cell selectively degrades sort of junky proteins and organelles such as aged dysfunctional mitochondria. Uh, so that the uh, the sort of the things can be recycled and used uh, to uh, make um, you know used for energy in other ways that that make the cell more efficient. So um, fasting does all these things and a lot more. And um, really, there's no medication that can compare to that. Just absolutely um, no way. I mean, I'm not anti-medication. We use them all the time. Uh, however. Um, when you look at the, um, the the power of fasting compared to medications, it's just uh, remarkable. And I really think we should be looking at implementing this more into clinical trials uh, to see just how much we can get out of fasting for our, our most difficult neurological disorders. So it is a kind of a, an overseer over the whole process. Yes, there are medications that work at AMP kinase like metformin. Yes, there is mTOR where it even derived its name, <clears throat> there is rapamycin and uh, analogs uh, available that would target uh, that uh, pathway um, and even approaches to PGC1-alpha. But the point is this, what, what you're saying is that fasting is overriding, encompassing a whole response uh, network in terms of dealing with the stress of uh, nutrient uh, scarcity, allowing the body to preserve itself and even enhance its ability from a, let's say, cognitive perspective right now to do the things necessary to find food. So it's not that we are the strongest or fastest, but suddenly we're tapping into our best resource, which is our, our brain, which really, you know, more than that, you know, more than anything else, I think distinguishes us from other animals. Yeah, that's right. And the, uh, the evolu we're tapping into an ancient evolutionary mechanism like fasting has evolved over. Uh, I mean, a lot of these uh, master regulators that we're talking about, you know, I didn't talk about mTOR and there's others, they're very old and ancient um, enzymatic pathways. And so we're just taking advantage of something that's been there um, for uh, a long time in evolution far before we were humans, before humans came on the scene. And um, that's, that's really powerful, potentially. On our Facebook site, we've been doing some fasting with you know several, uh, with thousands of people uh, at a time. I don't know, it's hard for me to know how many, but probably tens of thousands of people have joined us to do 24, 36 hour fasts. Uh, and we've been doing that, I think, um, it, it brings up an interesting point, but we've been doing it sort of to enhance autophagy in hopes of maybe providing a little bit of senolytic therapy so we can maybe have a younger population of immune cells that might serve as well uh, during mm -hmm. these immunologically challenging times, leave it at that. Uh, but that said, um, you know, there's an interesting thought that you, uh, you brought up the idea that fasting increases BDNF. Yes, it's good for neurogenesis. Yes, it's good for neuroplasticity. But we know uh, that studies have demonstrated people coming into the hospital with head trauma, for example, uh, and stroke, who have higher levels of BDNF tend to do better. So it also is um, insulating and reparative as it relates to neurons that have been traumatized. So even interestingly, from a preventive medicine perspective, fasting uh, may be a way of increasing BDNF and therefore helping to insulate the brain, you know, the cells from uh, as significant a damage in comparison to what they might otherwise have experienced, like in stroke. Absolutely. I mean, and if you look at the animal studies with, uh, you know, rodents, um, rodents that are fasted, um, f you know, for a period of time, I think it's three months or so, um, sort of time restricted feeding, fasting or alternate daily fasting before a stroke is induced in them, uh, compared to animals that are not fasted, uh, those animals that have been fasted have final strokes that are less than half the size, the infarcts are less than half the size of the ones that were not fasted. And um, yeah, they have uh, more neurogenesis and uh, things like that going on. So um, of course, you, uh, you, you, you can't automatically apply that to humans. That's the problem with translational medicine. And that's why it's so important we do human studies uh, to complement our animal research. But for, it's for very sure. tempting but to you know think, what, well, what um, if? Why not? You know, at least we can talk about it, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
Um, but what if, you know, we, we, if you were uh, on a serious fasting regimen, uh, and they're not, not that hard, as you, as you and I know, to do that and incorporate them into your lifestyle. And, you know, would that protect you uh, if you had a stroke? And I see strokes all the time. I see them almost every day. Uh, would that make your final infarct smaller? And, you know, obviously the, the thing is, of course, would it prevent you from make it less likely you were going to have a stroke in the first place? So it's very exciting. Well, I would say that uh, a couple other mechanisms that you might want to think about downstream uh, might be tumor necrosis factor alpha and, and IL-6 that are also down-regulated in the fasting state, again, through the AMP kinase mTOR pathway. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that uh, higher levels of both of those cytokines does tend to uh, correlate with worse outcome. Definitely. And uh, fasting has powerful effects on uh, suppressing inflammatory mediators, such as IL-6 and TNF-alpha, as you mentioned. So um, that's why I could apply to, uh, you know, other uh, inflammatory-based disorders, of, of which there are many, uh, such as uh, multiple sclerosis and cancer in people. Well, you know, there's a great segue. I want to come back to our topic, but or, or maybe we'll leave it for later. You wrote, uh, recently wrote a paper uh, uh, dealing with a patient with a metastatic thymoma treated yeah. with, I believe it was fasting? Yeah, so... Uh, I'll just give a brief outline of that one. Uh, so yeah, um, basically a young lady, 37, uh, and she was diagnosed with a metastatic thymoma, um, you know, about the size of a small football in her, uh, invading her lung and her lung pleura, which is the lining out around the lung. And it was actually invading the pericardium around the heart a little bit too. And um, it was not surgically resectable. And uh, she was offered palliative chemo. Radiotherapy was not an option. And uh, her oncologist, quite frankly, said, you have about one year tops. Um, he was being a, perhaps uh, uh, a little uh, um, more cautious but, uh, than the literature would suggest, but still not a good outcome prognostically for, with the conventional road. So she, what she did um, was we, we did a... a a two-year pro, uh, well, it turned out to be two years. It was, you know, at the start, we were like, it's as long as it takes, we're going to do this. And what she did was a uh, one week of uh, fluid-only fasting, so allowing water, tea, or coffee, um, every one to two months. And she started it off with a 12-day fast. The first was a 12-day. And she did that for two years. And in the interim, in the feeding period, she went on a fairly strict ketogenic diet. And um, that's uh, basically what she did. And uh, she I uh, had no chemo, uh, radiotherapy, or surgery for this. And uh, as you know, the result was fairly remarkable. Well, I would invite our viewers to, we've, we've done several podcasts on ketogenic approach to uh, malignancy and, uh, or cancer and uh, you know, very interesting information. Let's, let's get back to neurological conditions. There's one th sure. uh, a study that came to mind. Uh, and we're, as we were talking about autophagy or clearing out cellular debris, uh, there was a recent paper that talked about uh, the failure of the lysosome, uh, deficiencies of lysosomal activity. That's, let's say, that what digests this, uh, helps to digest the cellular debris. A, a failure or deficiency of lysosomal activity in Parkinson's as it relates to digesting some of this uh, abnormal protein and raised the idea of medic of that there may be medication to enhance lysosomal activity, but we've got that uh, covered right now. We can increase autophagy by, uh, by things like fasting. So um, do you suspect this, along with what you've described before and your results were outstanding, do you think fasting is going to play or could play a role in Parkinson's treatment? Definitely. Um, as you know, we published that uh, a uh, randomized control trial a couple of years back on a keto diet in Parkinson's. And really uh, the way I think about the keto diet is it, it mimics, it makes the body go into a pseudo fasting like state. And that's to me, the main power of the keto diet. Uh, I, I think fasting has more potential uh, at the time getting ethical approval for a study uh, in people with a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, it, it was hard enough to get it for a keto diet uh, to get it for fasting. I, 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 really didn't think that was um, going to be feasible. However, um, we've just uh, completed a 
randomized crossover in Alzheimer's, which is uh, hopefully going to be published soon of a, of a keto diet in Alzheimer's. And so now with, with the evidence building up for uh, keto diets and these neurodegenerative disorders, I think it, it, it is a nice time perhaps to introduce the uh, the concept that maybe we can start introducing um, fasting periods for these disorders in, in people and see if that can help. And for someone with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, I would introduce a very gentle uh, kind of fasting. There's different uh, ways to do it, as you know. So probably the easiest one is time-restricted feeding, where you could just say do a 16 and 8, which is like they fast for 16 hours a day, and then they eat for eight hours a day, sort of whatever you want, although I would probably make it more along the lines of a keto diet. And just do that. And yes, I would love to see what that does uh, in terms of autophagy. In theory, that should really uh, upregulate autophagy and uh, make it more effective at, at clearing these um, junky proteins, uh, you know, such as Lewy bodies and Parkinson's. And then, with, you know, with Alzheimer's, you've got um, Tau and the others um, that that are these diseases um, appear to be associated with quite strongly. It would be very, very interesting to see that what happens. Well, along the lines of the ketogenic diet and uh, certainly brought on by fasting is uh, the creation of ketone bodies. And I think one that gets a lot of interest, of course, is beta-hydroxybutyrate. And I think most of the attention on beta-hydroxybutyrate has been from its, uh, its fuel perspective, that it, it really, I wouldn't say it's a perfect fuel, but its ability to produce energy, ATP, with less production of free radicals, et cetera. There, there are multiple uh, highlights in the fuel area that the people talk about. But in your paper, you call attention to beta-hydroxybutyrate from other perspectives, like uh, as a signaling molecule. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so this actually opens a door to a much bigger uh, sort of paradigm. <laughs> paradigm, like So yes, beta-hydroxybutyrate is, is the main blood ketone um, that is uh, produced mainly by the liver, but elsewhere in the body too, from fat. And it has uh, several bioenergetic advantages over uh, glucose, which is the main fuel that people normally use for the brain. So uh, BHB uh, produces um, Dr. S uh, Dr. Veach, who unfortunately passed away um, just a few months ago, showed us that uh, compared to glucose, BHB um, uh, produces more energy, more ATP, and probably consumes uh, less oxygen as well. And then, um, so, so that's some of the bioenergetic advantages. But yes, it's also uh, got advantages as a signaling metabolite. It's, and this introduces the concept of uh, epigenetics, where your DNA, you can, um, although your sort of genetic code is fixed, you can alter how it is read. And uh, that's um, a really um, underdone area of medicine. I can't begin to explain how how underappreciated I think epigenetics is. And it's, it, you can actually alter um, uh, the expression of other, um, other uh, you know, sort of um, factors involved in metabolism via BHB. And, and that's just uh, so exciting. You can actually alter how the genetic code is read and, and introduce many other changes beyond just its, its direct role in energy. Yeah, yeah it's nutshell, been said that uh, genetics loads the gun and uh, environment pulls the trigger. So, mm. uh, you know, we are very empowered to think that we have a big role to play in our genetic destiny. Sure, uh, sure a, a far cry from what uh, we were told in medical school. We were told that our DNA lived in a glass case and that it was the sole determinant of everything uh, in, in the future. Yeah. How empowering and what a lot of responsibility now we have and we understand uh, what a role uh, this plays uh, in, in our lifestyle choices. You know, and, and it yeah. takes me uh, to another uh, area, and that is kind of this, this funneling uh, of information as it relates to one area that we know uh, that fasting is, uh, and a ketogenic diet for that matter, extremely effective for, and that is the actual intervention uh, treatment of metabolic syndrome, and specifically as it relates to insulin resistance and glucose homeostasis. And perhaps we can uh, talk about that in the context of how this relates to neurological conditions. Yeah. So, well, the metabolic syndrome is a risk factor for so many other disorders. And for, I'm sure most of your viewers know this, but the metabolic syndrome is like 
this sort of conglomeration of, of uh, factors. So um, sort of uh, obesity, but it's sort of uh, visceral and particularly involves uh, fat buildup in the liver. Um, and uh, with associated with type two diabetes and hypertension and um, abnormalities in the cholesterol profile. Now, um, that is a risk factor for uh, many neurological diseases, such as uh, stroke, uh, being the obvious one, but also uh, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, neurological cancers, and so on. So, if you can hammer away at metabolic syndrome, you will reduce the risk of getting neurological disorders in general. And there is no better way to hammer away at metabolic syndrome than when fasting. We have known for a hundred years that fasting flat out cures type two diabetes. And, and Dave, this is another thing we were not told in medical school that we were told type two diabetes is a chronic degenerative, uh, sort of chronic process. And you're always going to have it. And it's just going to keep getting worse. And it's simply flat out, not true. And uh, it can absolutely be reversed in the majority of cases. I have seen it and, and we have done it. And, and, you know, other people have done it a lot more, like Jason Fung, for example. So, um, and then uh, with regards to uh, obesity, well, uh, fasting obviously is, I mean, I don't think I need to go into the mechanisms. If you can implement a regular fasting regimen, it, it has marked uh, effects on obesity. And you can just, you can, uh, you know, again, I'll quote Jason Fung, go ahead and read uh, one of his books. And he can, he has done a lot of work on that, him and Megan Ramos, I should add. Uh, in terms of hypertension, fasting improves that tremendously as well. Now, you have to get into the longer fast to really hammer away at hypertension. Um, you have to do the, what we call periodic fasting if you really want to get it down, and that involves several days of fasting at a time. Now, that's you need a, li a little more guidance, so uh, perhaps from someone, a medical professional who knows about it. But if you really want to get blood pressure down, you can. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And I think the smaller fasting periods would help too. So... Um, those are three of the biggest factors of the metabolic syndrome. So if you can fast, if you can make this a part of your life, and it's not difficult. I mean, I, I'll never go back to not having fasting as a regular part of my life. Um, it just has so many benefits that if you can do that, I, I, you know, according to the data, you really should drastically lower your risk of getting a neurological disease. And they're some of the worst diseases, in my opinion, the worst. When we look at the big players in the world in terms of what is causing death, and uh, these are chronic degenerative conditions. It's not uh, infectious agents. It's not trauma. It's not war. It's the, it's the chronic degenerative, meaning lifestyle choice related, we talked about, uh, issues. And, uh, you know, and, you can, and cancer. Yeah, and cancer, uh, uh, which is also, as you say, related uh, very much to De nutritional choices. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Sarah Hallberg on the program a couple of years back showing reversal and, in fact, curing patients of type 2 diabetes uh, with a ketogenic diet over a one-year period of time. And I, I recently gave a lecture to a group of doctors uh, here in the States, and uh, I went around the room and uh, asked, how do you treat type 2 diabetes? And ba basically, every drug was mentioned. And I said, well, please understand that none of you is, by these answers, treating type 2 diabetes. You're treating the manifestations. As you and I mentioned earlier, you're treating the smoke, not treating the, the smoke. Nothing you yeah. do is treating the diabetes. The moment you stop the metformin or whatever drug you think is best, that following day, the blood sugar starts to go back up. So you really haven't done anything. You suppress no. one part of the story, uh, which is the blood sugar, or, the, or if they're measuring the exactly. A1C. Yeah. And uh, but what you're talking about is really treating the problem. And um, yeah. while some may challenge the relationship to neurological conditions of fasting of ketogenic diet, uh, no one can deny this powerful relationship of metabolic syndrome to risk for neurological uh, degeneration. And therefore, I think if we have to connect two dots to get between fasting and ketogenic diet to neurological diseases, so be it. Definitely. And yeah, like, uh, yeah, with regards to diabetes, the smoke is the blood glucose level and the fire is the insulin resistance. And we, uh, you know, in the diabetes world, we're constantly treating the smoke, we're getting that blood glucose down, it makes us feel good. And yet the patient comes back a year later, and you know, the medications need to be upped. And if you're giving insulin to the patient, well, the more insulin you give, the worse you're going to make that insulin resistance. So you're you make a thing, you're getting rid of the smoke in the short term, but in the long term, the fire is just smoldering away and getting bigger and bigger. 
And like you said, Dave, the, the diabetes is not being treated. So if you really want to hammer away at it, address the insulin resistance fast, reduce the body's need for insulin, you know, get rid of the glucose. And uh, wow, the HbA1c that you know, and the insulin resistance, they will lower and it will reverse. I mean, it's, it's just the way to go if you really want to cure your diabetes. You know, interestingly, in January, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, there was a, a, a terrific overview article really finally focusing on the fact that Alzheimer's is primarily a bioenergetic issue, uh, that it's not, mm. ne- it's not fundamentally a, an accumulation of beta amyloid caused disease. And yeah. you think of the billions of dollars spent on developing anti amyloid therapy when now we understand that the genesis is highly influenced by what we're talking about, bioenergetics. Yeah, so let's talk about smoke and fire again. The smoke in Alzheimer's is uh, the amyloid, the tau, and the, the uh, sort of proteins that accumulate. I'm not, a, you know, using autophagy to address that is a very good thing. However, the fire, in my opinion, is the mitochondrial damage in those diseases, and I don't think you'd disagree. Uh, I hope, well, I don't think you would. Um, the mitochondria are really damaged in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative disorders as they are damaged in cancer. And uh, so these diseases, uh, you know, <laughs> it's in medical school, I, we keep going back to medical school, but why not? So we often I learn about like things at the genetic medical school. <laughs> yeah, I would too. Yeah. We learn th- about things at the gen- genetic level, the cell level, the organ level, and the organism level, you know, behavior, and, eco- and then a, even a bit of ecology, but we skipped the organelle level. We never learned much about the organelles. Yeah, we learned about the mitochondria and the endoplasm reticulum and that a little bit, but we didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of the mitochondria, and that is where it gets really exciting. This is the problem. This is a problem. There are many other problems in how we're being taught and learning, but um, if you want to really understand Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, in my opinion, you must know more about the mitochondria. They are damaged heavily. And uh, keto diets and fasting directly address this problem. Um, so, and, and, and same with cancer. If you, I think if you really want to hammer away cancer, you really have to think about the mitochondria. I mean, dysregulated metabolism has only very recently become one of the hallmarks of cancer, which is which is unbelievable um, since, you know, Otto Warburg has been describing this stuff, it had, was, had described this stuff almost 100 years ago. So, um, yeah. I'll well, you there. call attention to uh, uh, Edward Dewey in the 1800s talking about virtually all of our diseases are due to the fact that we're overfed. So, you know, this isn't yeah. fairly new stuff. I mean, I... I I was no, talking not. about 20 years ago that I, I used the term uh, acquired mitochondropathy for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because back then we were began to recognize that mitochondria were the arbiters of apoptosis or pre-programmed cell death. That it was actually mitochondrial dysfunction that triggered the apoptosis caspase three pathway that led to then you know the cell destroying itself. So uh, mm-hmm. we, we've come a long way. I wanted to um, let our viewers know that you and I are writing a book, chap- uh, book chapter for Dr. Uh, Timothy Noakes, who is, uh, I think, a hero to all of us in terms of the low-carb world after yep. what he went through in, in South Africa. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working on that with you. That sounds, it's, I think, we're time. Well, anyway, uh, I want to wish you the best. I think we're getting ready for a big storm here, so I don't want to lose you. But I do okay. want to uh, thank you for spending time with us today and uh, say hi to your parents. You know, I met them before I met you. Well, I haven't actually met you yet, but anyway, so someday. Yeah, I will. Thanks a lot, Dave. All right, my friend. Talk to you soon. Well, that was an, a very, very interesting interview. What a uh, welcomed uh, approach uh, to the treatment and I would say probably the uh, prevention, you know, if you do it intermittently. Uh, of these neurological conditions for which we really don't have much going on in the way of meaningful therapy. Um, It's uh, interesting to note that uh, uh, Dr. Phillips described some really nice results as it relates to things like uh, Parkinson's. We've talked about that before. And as you see his upcoming study now dealing with using fasting as a treatment uh, in Alzheimer's disease, or at least, at the very least, using what's called a ketogenic diet. I want to read to you the conclusion 
of his recent uh, paper called Fasting as a Therapy in Neurological Disease that he published in October 2019. Here is the conclusion, an overview of the mechanisms of fasting. In an era of rising healthcare costs and increasing prevalence of neurological disease, the introduction of a self-empowering, cost-free, effective therapeutic option for a range of neurological disorders would be a welcome addition to the armamentarium of physicians. Today, most common neurological disorders are fundamentally characterized by defective metabolism on many levels. Given that fasting is a simple, multi-targeted, and essentially metabolic therapy with a healthy track record for treating a variety of neurological diseases in animals, it holds promise as a treatment for analogous diseases in humans. Despite this promise, the state of the evidence in humans is extremely limited. Many more studies are needed before the actual clinical efficacy of fasting as a therapy in human neurological disorders can be ascertained. Yet if these studies can be prioritized, perhaps the day will come when fasting regimens are prescribed alongside medication-based approaches, culminating in the inception of a unified metabolic approach, not only treating the symptoms, but also the natural course of the most common disabling neurological diseases in existence. Really uh, opening the door for us to uh, really embrace uh, a new way to conceptualize how we deal with these challenging disorders. Uh, thanks for watching today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Thank you for watching The Empowering Neurologist. We will be back soon. Bye for now.